Hello, friends. I hope that you are all doing wonderful. I know that I have had a busy week, but you know, everything is well my way. I have some pretty cool news、um, for my personal life. And I actually posted it on the social media because I'm just really proud of myself. I have been doing really well in school. And about, I think, a month ago, I received an email about applying to be part of the Omnicron Delta Kappa National Leadership Honor Society. And I received an email and a letter back. And pretty much it says that I have been selected and that invitations, so the initial invitation that I received. Was only sent out to like the top 35% of students at my college. And in the letter, it also says that out of all of those, they only selected 23 candidates, and I was one of them. So I have been in school for a little bit over a year now, and I'm graduating in May. Now that totally seems crazy, but I did have a lot of. Prior credits from when I was in the military that did get transferred over. And graduating in May is actually graduating early for me because initially I was going to graduate in August,、uh, next August. But I've been kicking butt. I've been getting straight A's so far. <claps> Knock on wood. And I just am going to continue to kick butt. I am trying to get into a master's program for mental health counseling. Because, as you guys know, I love to inform, I love to educate, and I love to help people. So, that's the ultimate goal in life. So, that's something very celebratory. Also, I have been going to the gym almost every day.、Um, from where I started, I have lost 20 pounds total. So, I'm super happy about that. I'm just going to keep working hard. Right now, my goal is to look super good in my cap and gown. So, it's kind of a good goal to look forward to. And lastly, I haven't really told too many people about this, but in December, I am planning on doing a little bit of stand up comedy.、Mm-hmm. I have some friends that are kind of in that world, and I like to think that I'm funny, <laughs> so、um, we'll see how that goes, and hopefully, I don't back out of it. But I, I have some things written,、um, and some are also about like, psychology, which I find. Fascinating, and I feel like there are things that we can joke about. Other than that, I've just been very intentional about spending time with friends, spending time in my devotional time, working hard at school, doing the podcast, doing my volunteering stuff. Yeah, I stay busy, and I don't know how I make time for it all, but somehow, you know, I do. Also, I think it's just due to a lot of prayer. So, Um, I think that this episode might actually be my first two parter.、Um, but don't worry, I won't make you wait a full week to submit the second episode. But this first episode, we're going to really dive in to who Jim Jones is. And who is that? Ever heard of Jonestown and the Jonestown Massacre? Well, you're about to get educated. I am your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you are listening to What the Psychology. Welcome to Jonestown. In the middle of the jungle, in Guyana, South America, Nearly 1,000 people drank lethal cyanide punch or were shot to death, following the orders of their leader, Jim Jones. Mothers and fathers gave the deadly drink to their children and then drank it themselves. People screamed, bodies trembled, and within a few minutes on November 18, 1978, 912 people were dead. Jones followers originally came to the Guyanese community known as Jonestown. Seeking paradise and escape from racism and persecution in the United States. Instead, they found something that resembled a concentration camp in which they worked long hours with little food and much abuse, those who escaped Jonestown have reported. 
Now, 25 years later, social psychologists continue to examine how Jones came to command such enormous influence over his followers' thoughts and actions. Jonestown, they say, offers important lessons for psychology, such as the power of situational and social influences and the consequences of a leader using such influences to destructively manipulate others' behavior. Just days before the Day of Reckoning, cut off from their families, Congressman Leo Ryan had come to investigate. Gosday says despite a show of unity, it was he who revealed their suffering in a written note that would accidentally end up in Jones's hands. It was great terror and fear. I never thought I was going to get out alive. Several tried that day, reaching a small plane on a dirt airstrip. But Jones's supporters would follow, killing Congressman Ryan and four others. Gosney shot three times in the stomach, he would escape to the jungle and survive, unaware who would not. In the aftermath, more than 900 lay dead from cyanide poisoning, including Gosney's five-year-old son, Mark. Now, this is very important why last week, or not even just last week and the week before, I went over compliance and manipulation. Because I feel like it was very important to set that foundation for when we start going into these cults. Of course, the first one is going to be Jonestown, but I have a few more others in the works. And any others that you suggest that I could look into? Now, what is very disturbing about Jim Jones is that him and other leaders, they appear to have derived some of their techniques from social psychologist research, which really raises the question about research ethics and the future direction of cult research. Now, guess who is questioning this? Philip G. Zimbardo. Remember him? Yeah, he's sort of kind of a psychology professor at Stanford University. You know, remember him? He's the one who did the Stanford prison experiment. I just kind of find it ironic how he wants to raise questions about ethics, but yet he had such an unethical um, experiment. But, yeah, I guess, guess I shouldn't really judge, but I'm kind of judging here. So, James Warren Jones, born May 13, 1931, in Crete, Indiana. So, he is known as Jim Jones, but, you know, maybe he had other nicknames. Maybe he was Jimmy, Jim Boy, Jimmy Boy. I don't know. (laughs) I'm just making that up, but I don't know. (laughs) He went by Jim later on in life. Now, however, when he was, I believe, only three years old in 1934... The economic difficulties during the Great Depression, it pretty much forced the family to move to a a nearby town called Lynn. And that's pretty much where he grew up in. But they pretty much grew up in a shack without any plumbing. Um, You know, the Great Depression affected a lot of people. So they did what they had to do. Now, Jimmy Boy and a childhood friend, they both claimed that his father was very racist, that he was associated with the Ku Klux Klan. And the KKK had become extremely popular in the Depression era in Indiana. And Jim later recounted how him and his father argued on the issue of race and how he even did not speak with his father for many, many years because one of the good things about Jim Jones that, I hate to say good things, but... He was completely for integration, and he was very supportive of minorities and us all being kind of together cohesively. But um, he had a black friend, and his father refused to allow him into the house. And that's kind of what caused them to not speak, which I can totally understand that. (laughs) I would be really mad if my family did not accept a friend of mine because of the color of their skin. So I I completely understand that. Now his parents, they did separate and he ended up relocated with his mother because of all the turbulence with his father. And they moved to Richmond, Indiana. And in December of 1948, he graduated from Richmond High School. He graduated early and with honors. So he was a pretty smart 
guy, he took his education pretty seriously. Now, to support himself after high school, he worked as an orderly at Richmond's Reed Hospital and was well regarded by the senior management. However, staff members later recalled that he exhibited disturbing behavior. One former co-worker of his, and they were actually childhood friends as well, he recalled an incident where Jones manhandled a patient while dry shaving him, and that resulted in the patient having an injury with the straight razor and then Jimmy boy gave a menacing look at said co-worker and it was at Reed Hospital where Jones met nurse Marceline Baldwin and that's who he married in 1949 and she actually went to Jonestown with him Uh, she died there with him pretty much But, uh, so him and his wife, they relocated to Bloomington, Indiana, and that's where he attended Indiana University in Bloomington. So there he was impressed with the speech by Eleanor Roosevelt about the plight of African Americans. Eleanor Roosevelt, she's, she was pretty much a boss. Like, a lot of people rag on her because she wasn't the most attractive, but she was very involved in social causes and... She, I think, was one of the big influencers of what a first lady of the president should be like. So, hats off to her. She was an incredible woman. Furthermore, in 1951, Jim and his wife, they relocated to Indianapolis. There, he attended Indiana University for two years, and then he took night classes at Butler University. He actually earned a degree in secondary education in 1961, which is about 10 years after enrolling. So in 1951, Jim Jones was about 20 years old and he began attending gatherings of the Communist Party USA in Indianapolis. And he actually asked himself, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? And his thought was that maybe he could infiltrate the church. So he was pretty shocked when a Methodist district superintendent helped him get a start in the church even though he knew that Jones was a communist. In 1952, he became a student pastor at the Somerset Southside Methodist Church, but later claimed that he left because its leaders forbade him from integrating blacks into his congregation. Around this time, he actually witnessed a faith healing service at a seven-day Baptist church. He observed that it attracted people and their money, and concluded that he could accomplish his social goals from financial resources from such services. Now, Jones was known to study Adolf Hitler and Father Divine to learn how to manipulate members of the People's Temple, which later becomes his church. I will get into that in a little while. So, he also admired Hitler to a point. When he was growing up, when his parents moved to Lynn, Indiana... That was right after World War II, and there were a lot of German prisoners of war there. And it is said that when he ran into them, he would do the Nazi salute and say, Hell Hitler to them. (laughs) Yeah. Also, Father Divine personally told Jones that, quote, To find an enemy and to make sure they know who the enemy is, as it will unify those in the group and make them subservient. To him, which nowadays that's a very common psychological thing. Whereas, if you can get a group to focus on something together, they unite better. And if you remember last episode when we talked about manipulation, one of the components was like paranoia and fear. If you convince people that you know the government is after us, you know, or if you say we are saved and everyone else outside of our little cult is not, and they're evil, you're all turning the people to focus on an enemy that they don't want to be a part of. So that's kind of where this came from. And it's very true. It's one of the tactics of manipulation. And it does seem to work. Now, especially about the stuff about Hitler and him kind of admiring him, I have seen many documentaries and commentaries about Jim Jones. And I have an issue with some of them because almost all of them have said, you know, he started all of this with the right intentions and 
blah, blah, blah. But he never wanted to do any of these for the right reasons. He was a hypocrite. It really doesn't make any sense how he admired Hitler, but yet was wanting social justice for African Americans or uh, the black population. So that makes no sense to me. And even though he had well intentions, I guess, with when it comes to racism and the social justice, he wanted to manipulate people, use their money and their resources to pursue those changes. So his heart was never really in the right place to begin with. Also, he was a Marxist and a communist, so he basically just wanted to control people from the beginning. He wanted to manipulate people. He even thought to himself, how can I spread Marxism? How can I manipulate people? How can I get the money to do this? <laughs> so I really don't know what his aims were. His aims was to have an integrated society, which I completely agree with, but from the get-go, he didn't want it to just be that. He didn't want it to be a peaceful thing. He wanted to be powerful and in control of people, regardless of their race. He declared that he was outraged at what he perceived as racial discrimination in his white congregation. And Jim established his own church and pointedly opened it to all ethnic groups. Which, I think that's really cool, honestly. But like I said, he never really wanted the right intentions. And who knows what really happened. He perceived something as racial discrimination when we don't actually know the situation. Um, so... He founded the organization that would become the People's Temple in Indianapolis in 1955. He distinguished himself with his civil rights activism, founding the temple as a fully integrated congregation. In 1965, he moved the People's Temple to California, where the group established its headquarters in San Francisco and became heavily involved right through the 1970s. Now, I think this is all great, honestly, because... Around that time in the 60s and 70s, that's when we saw a lot of the Jim Crow laws and horrible things that happened to the black and not even just the black population, but the majority was the black population. But anyone that wasn't white, really. Um, so I think that was cool that he started his own church that was fully integrated. But I think if he would have just left it at that and led them... And if he wasn't so set on controlling people and wanting to create a communist society and have control over people, he would have been a great inspiration today, you know. But luckily today we are integrated, you know, so. But I digress. To raise money for his new church, he imported monkeys and sold them door to door as pets. Y'all, that is insane. Insane. And one of the classes that I'm in is Intro to Anthropology. And you study some of the habits about monkeys. And I also watch a lot of nature documentations from time to time. And some of them have talked about people that owe pets that should belong in the wild, including monkeys. And it's crazy. Like, they're still wild animals. Like, <laughs> oh lord. Like, you're just trying to get money. And who knows how these quote-unquote pets are going to act. Okay, so Jones was able to begin his own church after a convention that he spoke at or that he went to. I can't remember which. And he had a lot of different names until it became the People's Temple Christian Church Full Gospel. Lord, that's a mouthful. And luckily, they later shortened it to the People's Temple, which makes sense because... His church was just, I don't, his, I don't really know what he preached at his church. I'm sure he preached a lot of integration. But for people to follow him, he must have made them think that it was like a us versus them mentality. Who knows what he actually preached, but. So he was actually ordained as a minister in 1957 by the Independent Assemblies of God. He has secured connections through the Pentecostal movement, which I know traditionally Pentecostals, they are very traditional. So Jones secured connections throughout the Pentecostal movement. And in 1964, he was then ordained by the Disciples of Christ. So he officially started his church in 1955. 
And then he was kind of ordained right after. And they moved a couple places. Like, they had their capital in San Francisco. However, in the summer of 1977, Jones and several hundred followers abruptly decided to move to the temple's communal settlement in Guyana. Officially called the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but everyone knows it as Jonestown. The community moved to Jonestown because Jim said that it was going to be a utopia, that it would be a place where we wouldn't have to lock our doors, that our children were safe, they could play freely without worrying about, you know, outside influences, no drugs, no cigarettes, no alcohol. It was going to be a very pure life where the community could take care of each other. So a paradise. Basically a paradise on earth. So that audio clip you just heard was from one of the survivors of the Jonestown Massacre. Her name is Leslie Wagner Wilson. And throughout this episode, I'm going to try to play audio clips from her and other survivors as well. It was promoted as a means to create both a socialist paradise. (laughs) Okay. And a sanctuary from the media scrutiny in San Francisco. That's just so paradoxical. Jones purported to establish it as a model communist community, adding to the temple compromised, quote, the purest communists there are. (laughs) However, Jones did not permit members to leave the settlement, so they had no freedom, which, I mean, that's pretty much what a communist, quote, paradise would look like. Jones claimed that he was the biological father of a child named John Vicker Stowen, though the birth certificate listed temple attorney Timothy Stowen and his wife Grace as the parents of the child. Now, the temple did repeatedly claim that Jones fathered the child in 1971 when Stowen had requested that Jones would be intimate with his wife Grace to keep her from defecting. Very weird. Grace actually left the temple in 1976 and began divorce proceedings the following year. Jimmy Boy ordered Stowen to take the boy to Guyana in February of 1977 in order to avoid a custody dispute with Grace. However, uh, Stowen actually defected in June of 1977, and the temple, they actually kept the child in Jonestown, which... I think is insane. How can they keep a child there that when both parents defected? But I guess Jones also claimed that the kid was his. So who knows? I mean, if I was a parent, I would fight for my child to come with me or I would have took them in the night when I left. But you find out later on how dangerous this group of people and how manipulated they actually are. So Jones also fathered Jim John and in parentheses, chemo, or chimo, K-I-M-O, with temple member Carolyn Layton. And remember, he was also married, so he was, um, getting around. And I guess his wife, he probably had permission from his wife, but who knows? We don't, I don't know. She ended up sticking with him because they died together later on in, um, Jonestown. In the autumn of 1977, Timothy Stowen, who defected, and other temple defectors, they formed a concerned relatives group because they still had family members remaining in Jonestown. Stowen traveled to Washington, D.C. in January of 1978, and he had a visit with the State Department officials and members of Congress, and he even wrote a white paper detailing his grievances against Jones and the temple. His efforts aroused the curiosity of California Congressman Leo Ryan, who actually wrote a letter on Stowen's behalf to Guyanese Prime Minister Forbes Burnham. The concerned relatives, they also began a legal battle with the temple over the custody of Stowen's son. Thank God, I mean, um, (laughs) I, yeah, that would be something that I would also do. But I'm sure the first thing he would have to do is establish paternity, too. But I don't know how big of a thing that was back then. I know now, if you get, like, a DNA test, you can prove that you're actually the father. That way, Jones can't actually claim that. But that could also turn bad if he wasn't the father. But who really knows? Who really knows? So most of Jones' political allies, because he had a lot of influence when he was in California and Indiana, 
and he became very popular because of his social activism. But when he left, he pretty much broke ties with everyone, with all of the political allies. Most of them, but not all of them. So Willie Brown, he spoke out against the temple's purported enemies at a rally that was attended by Harvey Milk and the assemblyman Art Agnos. On February 19, 1978, Milk wrote a letter to U.S. President Jimmy Carter at the time, defending Jones as, quote, a man of the highest character. And he claimed that temple defectors were trying to, quote, damage Reverend Jones' reputation with apparent bold-faced lies. Mayor Moscone's office issued a press release saying Jones had broken no laws. Yet, guys, he had broken no laws yet. However, I mean, in my opinion, if he was not letting people freely leave or making it so hard for them to leave, that's, what, kidnapping? Even, I mean, I guess the laws are probably different now versus back then. But even if someone goes willingly at first, if they want to leave and you don't let them, wouldn't that be kidnapping? Just a thought there. So... (laughs) On April 11th, 1978, the Concerned Relatives distributed a packet of documents, letters, and affidavits to the People's Temple, members of the press, and members of Congress, which they had titled, quote, Accusation of Human Rights Violated by Reverend James Warren Jones. In June of 1978, escaped Temple member Deborah Layton, oh, that name's familiar, remember Layton? provided the group with a further affidavit detailing crimes by the temple and substandard living conditions in Jonestown. I wonder what those other crimes were, because it doesn't say what crimes were, but maybe we'll get into a little bit more of that later, too. So Jones, he was facing increasingly scrutiny, or pretty much from the United States. In the summer of 1978, he actually hired... (laughs) a JFK assassination conspiracy theorist, Mark Lane, and Donald Freed to help make the case of, quote, a grand conspiracy against the temple by U.S. intelligence agencies. But until, like, defectors actually kind of made the case known about Jonestown, no one in government really knew or cared about them until this was brought to their attention. So, whatever, Jimmy boy. So, Jones did tell Lane that he wanted to, quote, pull an Eldridge Cleaver, referring to a fugitive member of the Black Panthers who was able to return to the U.S. after rebuilding his reputation. Obviously, we know that that did not happen. We do know that Jim Jones was the master behind the manipulation of these people. He was able to gain followers, get their obedience and their loyalty, And he was very charismatic. And of course, we talked about last episode some of the methods that people like him would use. We're going to dive into a few of those now. So, Jonestown should serve as a warning to the social psychology community. And what can happen when principles of influence are abused by members of an organization. We do know that Jim Jones, he studied Orwell's system of mind control described in 1984 and commissioned a song that his followers were required to sing at Jonestown about the advent of the year 1984. That is something that Dr. Zimbardo found during his research. So some of the mind control techniques that Orwell described in 1984 that Jim Jones also used included, quote, Big Brother's Watching You, So he used this idea to gain the loyalty of his followers. He required followers to spy on one another and blasted messages from loudspeakers so that his voice was always present while they worked, slept, and ate. (laughs) Second one is self-incrimination. I know we've we've talked about almost all of these in the last episode. This one, he instructed followers to give them written statements about their fears and mistakes And then if they disobeyed them, he used that information to humiliate them or subject them to their worst fears during public meetings. In 1984, the quote 1984 by Orwell, the main character's resistance is broken when he is subjected to his worst fear of being covered in rats. Wow. 
If someone covered me in frogs, y'all, no, I would probably have a heart attack and die. Like, <laughs> I would, I would rather die than being covered in frogs. Woo! I don't even want to picture that. Okay, yeah, moving on, because if I keep that in my mind, I won't be able to continue this episode. Um, suicide drills. So, Orwell is a main character said that the proper thing was to kill yourself before they get you in a threat of war. And we know that Jim Jones had his followers do this. Um, He had them practice suicide drills right up to the actual mass suicide event. He had them practice so often that maybe this last time at Jonestown, they probably thought it was just another drill. And they were indoctrinated to think that it is best to for all of us to die together than for us to be caught by the authority. Lastly, he distorted people's perceptions. So Jones blurred the relationship between words and reality. So for example, he required his followers to give him daily thanks for good food and work. Um, however, the people were starving and working six and a half days a week. <laughs> Similarly, Orwell described such a technique, which he called, quote, news or news speak. That's insane. But, I mean, that's exactly the society that he wanted. That's exactly the society that he created. And he deceived these people to think that it was going to be a beautiful thing, and it wasn't. They had no, no will of themselves, no free will. And that's exactly, that's exactly what people that want these things portray. <laughs> Is exactly like it. They fool people into thinking that that this cult, this society that they're starting is going to be beautiful and magical and it all ends the same. It all ends up the same or similar. So now by mastering such mind control techniques, Jones was able to gain followers, obedience and loyalty. He is probably the most charismatic cult leader in modern times in terms of his personal appeal, oratory, his sexual appeal, his just sheer dianism, and his total participation in the control of every member of his cult. That is a quote from Dr. Zimbardo. And I agree. I mean, here I am. I'm going to pull up pictures of Jones. And he was, he was a decent looking dude. And he came off as very charismatic. He had social things that he was very passionate about that most of the people in his congregation were also passionate about in a time where it was not acceptable. Those are all great things in themselves, but once he turned this into manipulation, trying to gain control of every member of the group, what is the point of supporting social justice of blacks and African Americans and other ethnic groups when you're going to turn around, start your own community, and have complete control over them. Isn't that a form of slavery? Maybe not as big as the one that we had here in the United States, but, I mean, yeah, very hypocritical. Jim was both charismatic and frightening, because on one end, he could talk to you like he knew everything about you, that he could show you so much love, and then on the, and then the next time he's telling someone to beat you because you slept during a a service or you talk back to someone. So he was charismatic because he could speak and he could relate to anybody in the audience, whether it was a revolutionary, whether it was a professional, whether it was someone that was religious, atheist. He touched everybody. He just, he had that ability. So these mind control techniques, coupled with the creation of a new social environment, This provided Jimmy Boy with a powerful influence over his followers. Quite arguably, Jim, through his natural understanding of social psychology, he knew the way to obtain a strong influence over his followers was to move them from their urban American environment to a remote South American jungle, generating uncertainty in their new surroundings, Keolandi says. And also some of this quote was from Zimbardo as well. When people are uncertain, they look to others for cues on what to do. Um, Remember, we talked about that when it comes to bystander effect. Zimbardo notes that people are particularly vulnerable when they are in new surroundings, feel lonely, or disconnected. Also, when you're with a group of people, you kind of look at each other like, like, who's assuming responsibility? What do we do? And people generally follow the crowd. 
No, when you believe it can't happen to me, that's when con artists or cult agents have you at their mercy. Because then you're not as vigilant to the little situational ploys that can get you to step across the line. Quote from Dr. Zimbardo. And I, I agree with that because we've seen that in many times. Remember the Milgram experiment? How a lot of ordinary people just continue to zap people? When you are manipulated and in your mind you're not thinking that, oh, it can't happen to me. You're setting yourself up to be more manipulated because you're not being focused on the hints of people trying to manipulate you. So there was actually another experiment talking about the power of the crowd. Social psychology has been doing this for decades. In the 1960s, Mr. Stanley Milgram, you know, Milgram's experiment dude, Leonardo Bickman and Lawrence Berkowitz, they demonstrated social influence by having a group of people on a busy New York sidewalk gaze up at nothing in the sky. When one man looked up at the nothing, only 4% of passerbys joined him. When five people stood on the nothing, looking up at nothing, 18% of passerbys joined them. And when a group of 15 gazed upward, 40% of passerbys then joined, nearly stopping traffic in one minute. As other cult leaders have done, Jim Jones used this, quote, power of the crowd influence in controlling others' behavior, intellect, thoughts, and emotions, says Stephen Hansman, who is a licensed mental health counselor. Woohoo! And he's with the counseling group Freedom of Mind and a former cult member. I think that is super interesting. I want to look up more about this guy. I have seen his name on some of the research products that I have personally done for class. So that's a cool little tidbit that I just learned about him. Really neat. Because that's my goal to be a licensed mental health counselor. So, wow, I didn't know he was a former cult member. Anyways, um, including instituting rigid rules and regulations, withholding or distorting information, using hypnotic trances and generating guilty and fear among followers is how he was able to influence the power of the crowd. However, since Jonestown, many social psychologists remain unaware of the psychological impact of the mind control techniques. Often elucidated in social psychology research, cults used to recruit and retain members. There's still a lot of research and skeptical things about for those. Many psychologists, they do remain skeptical that behavior is intentionally controlled by these organizations at all. They rather believe that people join cults on their own free will as they do with the traditional religious groups. Now, although they may join on their own free will, if they're not allowed to leave, that's a totally different story. And they still do use manipulation to get them to join. That's kind of my stance on it. However, those that do study cults, they blame and kind of more aligned to what I believe. They maintain that psychologists need to study how cults abuse social psychology research. Uh, we also need to develop effective treatments for cult victims to help them break free from a cult's influence before it's too late. So that in cases like Jonestown, history doesn't repeat itself. There's a quote here by Mr. Hansen. He said, it's shocking to me that so many people today have not even heard of Jonestown. He also observes of the lasting psychological effects every day in his work with former cult victims. And he says, cults are growing more powerful and more cunning in their deceit, often by using psychological research findings while the public remains largely unaware of them. This is why it's so important, I think, to do this podcast, to talk about these things. And even on a larger scale, we need to look at other forms of government that have used these tactics as well. And maybe we'll get into those as well. And maybe we can recognize patterns that we see in those and we can relate them to other things. We can relate them to cults, other forms of government, other social activities, those type of things. Now, if cults are going to abuse lessons from social psychology... It's only smart for psychologists to study how they're doing it. More attention to researching and working with cult victims is definitely needed. Psychologists need specific training to work with formal cult members. 
They need to be aware of these manipulation tactics. And unfortunately, some victims, they suffer from disassociative or panic disorders, which is truly sad. There are a lot of individuals who do suffer that we don't even know about, and they do need professional help. So, this is where we're going to stop today. This episode was more about the manipulation tactics and the background on Jim Jones. In the next episode, in part two, we are going to talk more about the actual occurrence of Jonestown. Maybe go into more detail about the manipulation tactics, but for now, we'll leave it there. I think that's a good place to start. So you get a little bit of juice, and then the next episode, you get the full squeeze. So what do you think? What are some other cults, societies, programs, anything that you can think of that uses such techniques? I know I've been picking on salesmen for the last few weeks, but they do use these techniques in order to be successful in their business, in their sales. So that's just a small one. But what else can we dig up? I am your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you've been listening to... What the? Psychology. Stay psych, y'all.